We're going to open up to Jeremiah, the 20th chapter, and read together verses 1 through 13. We have another one of those messages today that I'm sure is just preventative maintenance for you. I'm sure you don't suffer any discouragement or depression in your life. That's where you laugh. But um, we all do, don't we? And uh, the world, in the world, there is tribulation. And if anyone had sorrow and tribulation, it was Jeremiah. But he learned to come full circle and do the cycle and move from discouragement and depression into praise and thanksgiving. And God blessed him abundantly for it, even though you didn't see too much positive going on uh, in his life. So Jeremiah 20, you can read it on the screen or open up your Bible. I hope you got a bulletin today if you'd like to take notes. Jeremiah 20, verses 1 to 13 says, Now Pasher, the son of Immer, the priest who was also chief governor in the house of the Lord, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. Then Pasher struck Jeremiah the prophet and put him in the stocks that were in the high gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord. And it happened on the next day that Pasher brought Jeremiah out of the stocks. Then Jeremiah said to him, The Lord has not called your name Pasher, but Magor Misabib. For thus says the Lord, Behold, I will make you a terror to yourself and to all your friends, and they shall fall by the sword of their enemies, and your eyes shall see it. I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall carry them captive to Babylon and slay them with the sword. Moreover, I will deliver all the wealth of this city, all its produce, and all its precious things, all the treasures of the kings of Judah, I will give into the hand of the enemy, who will plunder them, seize them, and carry them to Babylon. And you, Pasher, and all who dwell in your house, shall go into captivity." You shall go to Babylon, and there you shall die. And be buried there, you and all your friends to whom you have prophesied lies. O Lord, you induced me, and I was persuaded. A transition here. You are stronger than I, and have prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. For when I spoke, I cried out. I shouted violence and plunder, because the word of the Lord was made to me a reproach and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. But the word was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. For I heard many mocking, fear on every side. Report, they say, and we will report it. All my acquaintances watched for my stumbling, saying perhaps he can be induced. Then we will prevail against him, and we will take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me as a mighty, awesome one. Another transition. Therefore my persecutors will stumble and will not prevail. They will be greatly ashamed, for they will not prosper. Their everlasting confusion will never be forgotten. But, O Lord of hosts, you who test the righteous and see the mind and heart, Let me see your vengeance on them, for I have pleaded my cause before you. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the poor from the hand of evildoers. Father, thank you for this portion of Scripture because in a small way we can relate to Jeremiah. And Lord, we have to ask your forgiveness when we don't handle circumstances and feelings and situations well and we look at what this man went through. Father, no success, pain, sorrow, all for serving you. Father, help us to be good soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to endure hardness. And Lord, if it be possible, might it be with joy, with happiness, with thanksgiving, so that the world will see we have a Savior. We love you and we praise you now. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated, folks. I try to jump around to different 
portions of Scripture in the Old Testament and the New Testament just to give us a little bit of a, a knowledge of the different things that are going on in the Word of God. And as I talk about discouragement and depression, I'm sure you know there are a lot of people I could have chose from uh, in the Word of God who went through difficult times and circumstances, and yet they trusted uh, in the Lord. And I won't even begin to name them now, but I understand we've all been there. We've all been discouraged. We've all been depressed, and discouragement moves to depression when discouragement is not dealt with properly. Just like anger moves to bitterness when anger is not dealt with properly, we need to understand what to do in the small areas so that we will not have to endure larger things because we have given ourselves over to our emotions. Uh, I have been doing a lot of rehab, as you know, not personally for me, even though I have received counseling in my life, but mostly small groups and taking care of the needs of individuals, whether it's sitting with individuals from the church, sometimes it's even talking on the phone to individuals from other churches who call me up and want to talk or have needs or send emails or texts, and that's a good thing when we get to know people through life and we're able to continue to help them. But here in Taunton State Hospital, I know for a fact, has not been an accident because Taunton State College probably, <laughs> Taunton State College, Taunton State Hospital has taught me more than probably I learned in any of my biblical training by sitting in the midst of groups and watching people and listening for their responses and dealing with social workers and monitoring medications, not that I prescribe them, I'm not a doctor, but I get to see what's being given and why it's being given and the documentation. They share just about everything with me and more and more the longer that I'm there so I understand what they're doing. So I've seen a lot and one of the things I noticed in the last year, you know I did uh, the ladies rehab program, it was called the RAP program and it was a women's rehab uh, program and what they would do in the morning, 20 to 30 women would come in there, mostly young women to break your heart, they would come in, they would sit down, and they would go through opening exercises. One of the things they would do, first they would give them the menu for the day. Here's what she can have for lunch. And usually half of them liked it, half of them complained and wanted options. So they would give them options. And it always made me laugh, the society we live in, that we complain over something we're receiving for nothing. You know, but they'd go ahead and they'd do that. And you know, we understood their background and where they were from. Then they would give them some rules, usually the rules they were breaking, you know, in a manipulative type way, and I'm a great manipulator, so I understood where they were coming from. They'd give rules. Then they'd get to the positive affirmation point. Every woman would have to come up with something that she could say about herself that would make her feel good, make her feel better. Some of the things that they would say uh, are, I'm beautiful. And everybody in the room, the 20 other ladies, the staff, they would all chant back, yes, you are. That one I would chant because I think before God they're all beautiful. I really believe that. Then some of them, for some reason, they love the one, and I've said it here before, I'm a good mother. That one I scratched my head. And when they all chanted back, yes, you are, I would not chant back, you are a great mother. I wouldn't. I would wait for the small group and I would address it in my small group when most of the staff had left, not all of them, but most of them, and I would talk to the ladies about it. Are you really a good mother? Where are you? You are in rehab. You have self-medicated. You have done things that are selfish so that you could be numb, comfortably numb, as the song states. You know? And I said, you have pushed your kids aside. They are with grandparents right now. They are with a dad right now, or a boyfriend, or a significant other right now. 
is that being a good mother? And I wouldn't leave them dangling there. I would talk about how can you become a good mother and have some hope because statements of affirmation just to prick our emotion for a moment and praise someone and make them feel good about themselves isn't going to help them grow. Sometimes they needed a loving rebuke to understand what needed to take place so that they would be healthy individuals. Now, affirmation, even if it's positive, it has its place. Sometimes it would turn the worst of the worst around to at least looking for help if they could feel a little bit good about themselves. So I'm not totally discrediting it. But positive affirmation, it won't heal you. It won't heal you when a positive statement is chanted. It won't give you affirmation because a group says you're doing something wonderful or because of a feeling that's within. You know as well as I do, that feeling will not last. How many feelings do you have a day? How many ups and downs do you have a day? How often do you say, I feel great, and by the end of the day you say, I feel lousy? How many times have I walked down the hallway at the state hospital and I go by a social worker and she says, how you doing? And I say, excellent. And then I go by another person and they say, how you doing? And I say, pretty good. And then I go by a third person and they say, how you doing? And I say, okay. Then I go by the final one in the hallway and I say, hang it in there. Boy, it changes within 50 yards walking down a hospital corridor because we are fickle. We are emotional. We are stirred up by what we see, by words we hear, by what happens to us, even by misunderstandings. Our life is dictated by that stuff. And don't you think Satan just loves dancing over us and wreaking havoc in our emotional system? So we have to be careful and realize it is more than simply positive affirmation, and we need to understand that. The key, once again, and I will never grow tired of saying it, is Jesus. Amen? It's Jesus. It's a relationship with the Son of God. It is the only thing that will help us. Listen, we cannot be affirmed and be healthy if no growth takes place. Jesus will help us to grow. Anger untreated, I mentioned, turns to bitterness. And then discouragement not treated turns to depression. And I don't know if you've ever been clinically depressed where you needed medication, but it's not a good thing. It's not a good feeling. It's not a good place to be. Now in the scriptures, we're talking about Jeremiah. Hey, what other book did he write? What other book did Jeremiah write? What's that? Don't be afraid. Lamentations. And the little prefix is what? Lament. Right? To be sad. To be broken. So Jeremiah not only tells his story in the book named after him, but he writes Lamentations to let you know just how bad it was. And God's not just having people whine so that, you know, misery loves company. He's trying to show us how Jeremiah still rejoiced, still thanked God, still made it through. Because we need to know how to do that. And Jeremiah, we find, was a prophet. He was a priest. And yet he was definitely discouraged. And we find he's giving his word, God's word, to a rebellious people who aren't listening. And he's serving before a chief deputy priest called Pasher. And as he preaches about the coming captivity and the coming series of terrible events, Pasher doesn't like it because he's got a cushy job. He's in the ministry. You know, he gets to claim all of his outfits when he does his taxes. You know, I joke, I joke with our tax guy. He says, anything else you want to claim? And I'm sitting there in jeans and a sweatshirt. And I said, yeah, my uniform. You know, can I get some credit for that? And he just smirks because he knows me. You know, and he just ignores me. Uh, just to be as straight as I can 
can be about it. He had a cushy job. He had a good salary. He had a good retirement plan. Here's this guy messing things up. You're not living right. You're not doing right. You need to repent. Nations are coming to take you into captivity because you've turned your back on the living God. And Pastor said, I'm not putting up with this. So he beats them. How many of us have been beaten for our faith? He puts them in prison, in the stocks. And after he's there a while, he lets Jeremiah out, and Jeremiah doesn't say, Whew, sure, I'm glad I'm out of there. I won't open my mouth again. Jeremiah marches right back to the chief deputy priest, Pasher, and he says, hey, buddy, let me tell you what's going to happen to you. He said, you are going into captivity. You are going to die there. You and your friends and your family. It's not going to be good for you because you've turned your back on God. So all he's being is honest. Honesty can get you in a lot of trouble with a lot of people. And that's why we have to always grace it with love. And it should never be condescending. It should always be, I'm giving this to you because I want to help you. But sometimes, we're no different. Pastor didn't like what Jeremiah was saying. I have had times, and I know pastors have times, they stand before people, and as long as they're giving people what they want to hear, they're happy with it. But if they happen to step on some toes and talk about sin and talk about attitudes, then there's a problem. I have had problems standing before people, sitting with individuals, trying to get through to them, trying to tell them what they needed to do. Do you think I like that? This is one guy who does not like confrontation. I would just rather preach my sermon and then put some wheels on my shoes and wheel me into a closet and shut the door and say, we're done with him for a whole week. And then when Sunday comes again, just, you know, take me out, put me back up here, and I'll preach another one and then get rid of me. You know, I, I, you, you know, you can slide my check under the door, you know, and uh, just make sure you take care of my wife for me and my dog. I'd appreciate that, and my cat. And uh, that would be a good thing. But that's not pastoring. Pastoring, most of it goes on during the week, on the phone, one-on-one, -on -one, right? This is the easy part, because when I preach in the state hospital, they all talk back while I'm speaking. They all say nasty things. You know, I told, I told the story of Jonah last week. It was very sad, and they were hysterical laughing. They thought it was the funny thing, because they didn't understand the word Nineveh. Nineveh, Nineveh, Nineveh. I'm like, can you put me on? You're not shushing me. You know, I go through it. Here, even whatever you're thinking, it could be negative. Usually you don't say it because you're polite. You know, so I appreciate that. No one has ever thrown anything at me even though some might have desired to throughout the years, because I've gone through my maturity. When I was a young pastor, I probably said some things I shouldn't have said. You know, that wouldn't hurt me, Alan. You can try it if you want. <laughs> but um, uh, me, me and Maddie, we throw that at each other, the little red uh, microphone cover there. Listen, what do we do when we're discouraged? What do we do when we're depressed? You know what a lot of people do when it's here with us? It's at the hospital. Here's some of the things people do. I'm just going to sleep. Don't you sleep when you're discouraged sometimes? And you might say, sleep? What's that? I can't sleep. You know, maybe you've got a lot of activity going on in your house and you can't. But if you're able to, you go into a room, you pull down the shades, you make it as dark as you possibly can, and you just want to be left alone. And you sleep. Some people go to sleep at 5 o'clock late afternoon in July when the sun is shining. And it's hard to make your room dark. I walk through the halls of a hospital. Sometimes I have 10 people in a room for my group. Other times the nurses say, they're all asleep today. And it's 10 o'clock in the morning. And they've had breakfast, but they're depressed, so they go back to sleep. Sometimes we sleep. Sometimes we self Medicaid. It might not be drugs and alcohol and chemical abuse. You know, it could be a number of different things that we self-medicate with so that we can be numb and escape. 
Sometimes we blame others. Get that one? Sometimes we blame others. Sometimes we deny. Sometimes we retreat. Sometimes we form disorders in our life or physical conditions. Sometimes we're defensive. Yeah, how you doing? I'm good. I'm fine. Don't ask again. Right? We do a lot of things. Some people are addicted to the wrong kind of relationships. They go from one bad relationship to another. And they think this one is better, but they haven't really thought about it, and they haven't allowed God to teach them and help them to grow and go by His timing. You know? Haven't you seen women and men that say, I'll never marry someone like my father. I'll never marry someone like my brother. And maybe you obtained that. Maybe you, you stayed away from that. And thank God for that. But a lot of people don't. A lot of people have problems. So, how can we rise above discouragement and depression? A couple of simple things. Number one, be honest. Be honest. Tell God how you feel. Tell Him how you feel. And you're like, well, I don't know if He wants to hear that. Do you really think He doesn't know? Does He know how you feel? Of course He does. Look at verse 7 of Jeremiah, the 20th chapter. Jeremiah says, O oh Lord, You induced me. I was persuaded. You were stronger than I and have prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. You know what he's basically saying? You took advantage of me. You're stronger than me. You imposed your will on me. I don't even want to be a prophet. You chose me while I was in my mother's womb. That's not fair. I didn't raise my hand. I didn't get a vote. You ever feel that way? How did I get into this? I didn't sign up for this. God says, I signed you up. Don't try to escape it. Pray for faith and pray for wisdom. And I will see you through. So be honest. We don't like to be honest sometimes. We think God doesn't know. I've told you about the old women in the nursing home when I'd preach. I'd get to the end of the message and I'd say, if something's going on in your life and you're broken and you need to make a decision, I want to help you. I want to pray for you. I won't embarrass you. Lift up a hand so I can pray for you. Ooh, they hate that. Most people hate that. But I've noticed people who really mean business with God through the years when they raise a hand, some people won't put them down. Some people are like, <laughs> you know, ready for their rotator cup to tear. You know, <laughs> they're just, you know, they want me to see. It's like, man, that touched my heart. I got to do something. But in the nursing home, I said, raise a hand if you need to make a decision. And you watch carefully, and then a little old woman goes, and I'd say, I see that hand. You've never seen an old woman move so quick in your life. They want to raise it because they know it's them. I saw that. You know, they, they want you to know they have a need, but they're embarrassed. They don't seem to understand that God knows. So why don't you just agree with God? I say that to people when they're lost. You think God doesn't know you're lost? You think God doesn't know you're not going to heaven? You think God doesn't know what your needs are? Just be honest and tell Him. David in the Old Testament was honest. David would actually complain to God. David would actually whine a little bit to God. And by the end of the psalm, David would come full circle, the cycle, and be praising God. That's the way that it is supposed to work in our lives, that we go full circle and we make the right decisions to God. And if you start talking to God and be honest, He'll bring you around. I've told some of the folks here, I've told Dan this, I'll come to church sometimes on a Sunday morning, I feel rotten. I don't really want to be here. You know, you'd be honest, you'd say that too sometimes, you don't want to be here. You know, oh, i got to go to church. You wake up, the rain is pouring on the windowsill, and you're just getting some good sleep, and it's quiet in the house. It's like, oh. But then we start practicing the songs and my heart starts to lift. And I start listening to the words. And it's not because we're so, so excellent. It's the words minister. And sometimes it's Scripture. And by the time we get to the teaching and the preaching time, I'm feeling pretty good. Because God has ministered to my heart. And I find myself repenting sometimes. 
in my mind, silently, Lord, I'm sorry I came with such a bad attitude. Why is it always, Lord, that I come in a rotten mood and by the time I leave, my heart's right with you? Wouldn't it be great if I came and my heart was right? If I came and I was ready to worship? If I came and my emotions were in the right condition? Wouldn't that be great? We're supposed to be here to praise God. We're supposed to be here to celebrate. It's not supposed to be we crawl through the door every week you know, with a nasty look on our face and by the time we leave, we're like, I'm good now. I'm good. I got my fix. You know, God says, oh, that's so wonderful. Thank you for praising me today. Right? Come on. You know, God, we need to, isn't he worthy of our praise? He's worthy. So we ought to come in the car saying, Lord, I'm going to confess some sin right now. Hey, family, let's get it together right now. So we can come to church and worship God the way he deserves to be worshipped. So be honest. Habakkuk. The prophet with the crooked name, one of the minor prophets, he saw Babylon bearing down on them, and he complained. He said, Lord, this isn't right. You are going to judge the righteous with the wicked? If that's true, wrong judgment is going forth. Can you imagine saying that to God? Some of you would have been afraid to say that to your dad. You did what, dad? I don't agree. Oh, really? (laughs) I'll help you agree. Right? He said this to God. And God was kind. Because he wasn't charging God foolishly, he was just being honest, telling him what he felt like any child would. Wanting to learn, wanting to understand. And Habakkuk, after he said all that rough stuff to God, he said, I will now stand over here and get ready for my rebuke. As your mom or dad ever said, go to your room, think over what you've done, and I'll be in in a minute. And the worst part of that is waiting. (laughs) Knowing that you're going to get beat up or something. Or mom or dad walks in after an hour and they look at you sweating and they say, I think you've suffered enough. And maybe they leave you alone. I don't know. Listen, be honest with God. Don't allow your feelings to dictate your responses. 1 John 3.20, one of my favorites. Jeremiah says, you've deceived me, Lord. It's pretty strong. I didn't sign up for this. You're stronger than me. You took advantage of me. I don't want to be chosen for something when I'm in my mother's womb. That's not fair, right? I need a vote. I'm in derision, means I'm ridiculed, I'm made fun of. Everyone mocks me. When's the last time you were honest with God? You might say, well, he knows anyway. Yeah, but he wants to hear it from you. You have not because you ask not. Don't we sometimes need to say, Lord, I get it. I know what I'm doing. I know you're not pleased with me. I just want to let you know I get it. I know he knows. And that's kind of a dumb answer to say, well, he knows anyway. You know, he wants to know that we know. Right? So we ought to come before him and say, I know. And I'm going to change it. Help me. To change it. The second thing, be obedient. Keep doing what you've been called to do. Even when you don't feel like it. Because if you only serve God when you feel like it, how often will you serve? Verse 9 of Jeremiah 20. Jeremiah said, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding back, and I could not. Have you ever felt that way? You tried to do something right and everybody rebuked you for it and you said, that's it. No more. I'm done. Why should I be hurt for doing right? You ever been hurt for doing right and you know your intentions were pure and you suffered rebuke for it or heartache and you said, that's it, I'm done. God said, no, you're not. Because that's not why I created you. It's not your choice. Everybody understand that? It's not our choice what God has chosen for us to do. We're chosen, right? So we have to do what God wants us to do. Jeremiah was a prophet. That's what he did. He preached. Remember Jonah? Hospital all laughing at me this past week. He was a prophet. He didn't want to go to Nineveh. He hops on the boat to Tarshish going in the opposite direction. Tells the boys, 
I'm Hebrew and I'm being disobedient to God. Lost people look at him and say, why? Why are you disobeying God? Have you ever had a lost person rebuke you? Isn't it embarrassing? Why are you living like that? That's not you, is it? Why are you talking like that? Why are you talking like us? That's embarrassing. And they said, you're Hebrew and you're in disobedience to God and we're going to die from this storm? Are you kidding? He said, don't worry about it. Just throw me overboard. We can't do that. They even had integrity. They didn't want to kill him. We can't do that. So it says they rowed harder. In the Hebrew, it means they dug their oars deeper into the water. We don't want to kill you. But eventually they had to throw him overboard. And then the word of the Lord came a second time to Jonah and said, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. Why? You're a prophet. (laughs) It's what you do. It's what you're called to do. If God asks you to witness to somebody, don't go, why? To who? I don't like him. You know? A lot of people I don't like. Jonah didn't like those people in Nineveh. And you know what? I understand why. Terrible people, terrible place, but he was a prophet. He had to do what God called him to do, whether he wanted to or not. So be obedient. Proverbs 16.3, if you're taking notes, says commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. Jeremiah says, I'm done. I didn't sign up for this. I don't want to preach anymore. But the transition, but his word was like a fire. In my bones and I grew weary from abstaining and forbearing. James 1.22, what's it say? Be ye doers of the word. Not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Why should we do it? It's what we've been called to do. I have a friend down in New Jersey. His name is Ritz, like the cracker. He's Filipino. And Ritz plays the drums and the guitar. And Ritz's favorite verse, I think I quoted it once, and it was like his life verse. Luke 6.46, Why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? You know, you give one verse of Scripture and it stays with somebody for the rest of their life. He gave me a pen that had that inscribed on it because it meant so much to him. You know, the Word of God ought to mean that much to us. Imagine Jesus looking us in the face and saying, why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? I have called you to do such and such. Be faithful to do. Thirdly, be watchful. When I'm discouraged, I don't want to look to the right and the left and see who will help me because it only gets worse. You ever find that? You know, you're looking for help and nobody wants to help you. I would look up. I would be watchful. I would say to myself, what is God going to do in this situation? I think God likes that. Lord, I'm discouraged. I need you. You need to come through for me. I'm looking to you to work a miracle in my situation. Look at verse 11 with me. It says, but the Lord is with me as a mighty awesome one. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and will not prevail. They will be greatly ashamed, for they will not prosper. Their everlasting confusion will never be forgotten. Jeremiah says, God's going to get them. God's going to get the glory. God's going to work this thing out. And I'm watching to see how He does it. We ought to say, Lord, open my eyes to look around and realize what the big picture is. To understand that God is merciful. God is just. God is going to work things out in a fair manner. Open my eyes, Lord. The Lord is with me as a terrible one. That was to Jeremiah's benefit. I don't like thinking God's terrible if it's in relation to me. But I love knowing He's the terrible one if it's in relation to my enemies. That I want to hear. That is a benefit because I know God tells me not to judge anybody because I don't know how. God says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. So look around and say, Lord, here's the situation. I love you. I'm trying to serve you. Please make things right. I'm going to watch for your hand in my life. What will God do? Watch and see. 
You know what we normally do? We rush off to try something else. We're control freaks. Wow, I'm in trouble. I guess I better do this now. I guess I better make some phone calls. I guess I better check my aces in the hall. Why not just watch and see what God will do? Do we have enough faith for that? Then we need to pray for some more faith because it's a gift. Lord, increase my faith. Please, Lord, be watchful. And finally, be worshipful. There's nothing more powerful than being worshipful and worshiping God when we go through difficult times. Praise God with your whole heart. Look at verse 13. Here's Jeremiah who started out saying, you've overtaken me, Lord. You took advantage of me. You're too strong for me. You called me while I was in my mother's womb. No fair! Now he's at the end of the chapter and he says, sing to the Lord. Praise the Lord, for He has delivered the life of the poor from the hand of evil doers. I want to know that from beginning to end. How about you? I don't want to just get it together every single time at the end after I've suffered greatly. I don't want to trip over the same things over and over and over and over again. I want to learn some things. How about you? I want to be able to smile and look around and say, God's going to do it. God's going to do it. God is going to take care of things. I remember the Rocky movies where Rocky's getting beat to a pulp the entire match. And at the end, he starts to come back against Clubber Lane or whoever it was. And his wife, who's sitting in the stand, she goes, he's going to do it. He's going to do it. You could just see things turning. And now the momentum was changing. How about that Patriot game? At what point in the fourth quarter did you say, wow, he's going to do it. He's going to do it. I had no faith whatsoever. I said to myself, well, at least it's respectable now. I said to myself, oh, brother, he missed the extra point. We'll probably lose by one. I said to myself, oh, they're going to need two two two-point conversions. Ain't going to happen. It took me all the way to the end to say, I can't believe this. It happened. Are we that way in our faith? I can't believe it. God came through because He loved me, but I didn't trust Him any step of the journey. But He came through because He loves me and I belong to Him. Wouldn't it be great if from the beginning we said, I'm looking, Lord, I'm watching, I'm looking around, I know you're going to do something. I know you're on your throne. You've done it before. I'm moving from faith to faith and strength to strength. Wouldn't that be great? You ever have your kid come up to you and say, I know you're going to do it. I know you're going to come through. I trust you, Dad. I know it's going to happen. That makes you want to do it more, doesn't it? You know, you're darn right, son. Watch this. You know? I used to finagle with a vice president of a Bible college when I wanted a job as a dean of students. I looked at him and I, he said, I can get you that job. And I knew how to stroke his ego. I'd say, can you really? You can do that? You have that kind of control, that kind of power. You can get me in as the dean of students. (laughs) Just watch me. (laughs) Dads and leaders love that stuff. You know, I know sometimes it's fleshly, but God loves when we praise Him. God loves when we trust Him. God loves when we look up at the beginning of our problems. Sing unto the Lord. Praise the Lord, for He has delivered the soul of the poor from the hand of evildoers. Praise, one writer has said, is the one weapon in the Christian arsenal for which Satan has no defense. Praise and thanksgiving. Here's what we're saying when we praise God in the middle of pain and sorrow. We're saying, I recognize there's a provider when I praise God. I acknowledge there's a plan when I praise God. Praise accepts the present situation. Thirdly, remember Acts 16, Paul and Silas in the stocks? Midnight, they sing. Were they nuts? They're singing and praising God. They accepted their present situation, and praise releases the power. That's when there was an earthquake. That's when the doors opened up. That's when the big burly Roman soldier came in and fell on his knees and said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in all thy house. He went back to the jailer's house and his family was saved and baptized too. 
Can you praise God in the midst of persecution and difficulty? That's when God really works. That's when God really shines. When we can give Him our trust even when we don't get it. I don't think Jeremiah still really understood it all. But he came to the point of saying, sing to the Lord. Praise the Lord. He's delivered the poor from the hand of evildoers and He'll do it again. Ever that way, you're not sure of all the answers, but you think, I better praise my God. He'll come through. Let's bow for a word of prayer together. Heads bowed and eyes closed. I know sometimes we look for something magical in church as a formula for never being discouraged or depressed again. It just doesn't work that way. It is a series, it is a progression, it is a systematic effort. It starts out with being honest. Just being honest. Don't make like you're some great spiritual champion if you're floundering. Sometimes that means talking to somebody. Saying, I'm hurting, I'm broken, this could be it. I don't know if I serve God anymore. Be obedient. Keep doing what you've been called to do, no matter how you feel. Be watchful. God's worked before. I'm going to look up and see what my God's going to do. I'm not going to crawl across the finish line. I'm going to trust God to help me finish well. Finally, be worshipful. Because worship recognizes a provider. It acknowledges a plan. It accepts our present situation. And praise releases God's power. Maybe you're here today and you might say, Pastor, God already knows. But so that you might keep me in your prayers, I'm a little discouraged today. Please pray for me. Pray for my discouragement. Anybody like that today? I see your hand, brother. I see your hand, ladies. I'm a little discouraged. I'm a little down. Kind of hard to serve God and be joyful when we're down and we're discouraged. God doesn't want to leave us there. How can we overflow into the lives of others? Lord God, help us. In the world, you'll have persecution, but be of good cheer. He's overcome the world. Let's look up. Let's trust Him for great things. Father, I thank You for Your Word. If I didn't read Your Word during this week in particular and trust You to encourage me, I'd have no message, Father, but the message isn't mine. It's yours. We all flounder. We all hurt. We all get sad. We all get overwhelmed. We all have misunderstandings with You. Why are You doing this, Lord? Why did You call me to do it? Why aren't things working out? Sometimes it's just timing. Sometimes it's our faith growing. Sometimes it's more wisdom needed. Sometimes you just want to make us more like Jesus. Help us to get it, Lord. Help us to endure hardness as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Be with the folks that raise their hands, Lord. Reveal yourself to their minds and hearts and the things that we've talked about today out of Jeremiah 20, out of the book of Habakkuk, out of Jonah. Men, and there's also women who struggled with doing the right thing. We're not always going to be patted on the back, but Lord, might we do it for You. We love You, we praise You, and we thank You that we can come into Your presence right now. We ask it in Christ's name and for Your sake. Amen. Amen.